All right, welcome back, forensic students. Today we are talking about observational skills, um, which is definitely something that we use quite often in forensics, both in class and as forensic investigators. All right, so I want to do a little observation exercise with you. So I want you to glance at this picture. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds just to soak it all in. And then I'm going to ask you a series of questions. So just kind of glance over the picture. Right now on a sheet of paper, I want you to answer these questions. Don't cheat. Don't go back. Um, it's not for a grade. We just want to see how many of these questions you can get right based on that little 30, se uh, 30 second snapshot um, of that image that you saw. So number one, write down what was the color of the truck? Number two, what did the sign say that was posted on the light pole, the very first light pole? Number three, what was the speed limit? Number four, what did the sign on the second light pole say? Number five, what was the make and model of the van that was approaching the truck? Number six, did the truck have a passenger? And number seven, what time of day was the photo taken? So once you have all these questions answered, go back to the picture and see if you got the questions correct. Um, and you can just kind of go back and forth. You can rewind the video if you want to. Um, now, a couple that students typically get right. So typically, the question that says, what was the speed limit? Most of the time, students guess that correctly, 35. Um, and let's talk for a second about why that is. So when you look at a picture, an image, or a situation, and you only have a glimpse of it, like you did with this situation, things that stand out are going to be things that are simple, bold, clear to your mind. Um, and we're going to go in a lot more depth in the lesson today. But because this sign is just black and white, very bold font, it is in the center of the photo, your eye is naturally drawn to that. So most of the time, this is a question that most students get correct. Um, another question that most students get correct is, did the truck have a passenger? Because one of the things that you may notice in this picture is somebody has their arm out the passenger side window. And so if you notice that in your 30 second glimpse, then you would have got that question right. Now, some things that students typically get wrong. Um, the yard sale sign, that is not... Um, that is not a very clear, bold sign. So students tend to disregard that when they're just kind of skimming over an image. This is the perfect example of marketing. So when people make billboards or signs and they want their company to be seen or their message to be seen, it is best practice to use very bold, simple fonts um, that's not very busy because the eye is naturally drawn to that and the eye and brain can work together to help you remember that information. Um, so you can see yard sale, why most people would not notice that. It doesn't jump out at all to you. Um, now on the second light pole, a lot of people get the no parking sign because again, that's something that you n probably noticed and paid attention to when you glimpsed over um, this image. Most of the time, students do not get the question right about what's the make and model of the van approaching the truck. This is a Dodge Caravan. Um, now, typically from time to time, I will have students that say, I did get that right. 
Um, and then we have the conversation. Well, why did you get that right? Did you notice that? Did you, um, is there some sort of prior knowledge that you have to a Dodge Caravan? And a lot of times we find that a student might say, well, 10 years ago, we had a Dodge Caravan. So I recognize that make and model. Or my aunt drives a Dodge Car Caravan. So I recognize that in the picture. So it sort of tied into a past experience or prior knowledge, which is something that we're going to talk about today. Now, the time of day that this photo was taken, this photo was actually taken at 11 a.m. And of course, that would be hard to know unless you had a reference like a clock or a watch, and we don't in this picture. So it's okay if you didn't get the question correct. In fact, it's okay that you didn't get any question correct um, because I just wanted to do a little test to see where you stand in your observation skills. We're going to talk today about why um, some, pe some things are easier to observe, some things are easier to remember than others. We're going to talk about a little bit about how the brain works. Um, so this is a pretty interesting lesson today. Right, so the first thing you need to know is that forensic investigators rely on their ability to do a few things. First, observe. So they need to get to a crime scene and observe their surroundings. They need to be able to interpret the things that are important um, and separate those things from extraneous pieces of information. And then once they have observed and interpreted and they have drawn a conclusion, they have to be able to report their observations. So forensic investigation sort of encompasses a lot of different areas. So examiners have to be able to identify evidence, record it, and determine its significance, which sounds easy, but any investigator will tell you it is not quite that simple. Um, and the reason why it is difficult is because human error is always a possibility. So in addition to taking on the Sherlock Holmes role and trying to find evidence, they also have to work against human error. So investigators, when they question witnesses, they have to keep in mind how the brain works and how witnesses, eyewitness testimony can be faulty. Um, they also have to understand that their own human error might get in the way. Sometimes biases um, and preconceived notions get in the way. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move through Unit 1. You need to know that we're constantly gathering information about our surroundings. So even now, um, as you watch this video and listen to my voice, there are other things going on around you. Um, for some of you, it might be a lot going on around you. And then for others, very little. But we've all constantly got information coming at us um, in every different direction. And our brain's job is to filter that information. So how do we collect that information? Well, we do so with our five senses. Um, and so our five senses are always at work to gather information, and then it sends it to the brain, and the brain's job is to filter it. So have you ever heard somebody say, oh, that went in one ear and out the other? Well, that's really sort of a thing. Um, all the things, all the information that bombards us on a daily basis, we can't hold all of that information. Our brains are not designed for that. So there are some things that our brain does to filter out what it deems as important versus not important. So one of the things that we have to do as investigators or even as students is to pay attention. So paying attention is key to taking in all those details and making our brain realize that, hey, this is important. Because if you don't pay attention, if you block it out or tune it out, your brain thinks, oh, well, I'm not supposed to retain this information. And so it won't. And this requires what we call conscious effort. You really have to try to pay attention. Um, so if you're watching this video and you didn't have much sleep to, uh, last night, then you're probably like in and out, daydreaming, staring off into space. Um, and some lessons are more exciting than others. So as teachers, we have to try to figure out things that will grasp your attention. Um, and then as students, if you need to remember something, you also have to sort of get creative about how you pay attention to stuff and how you're, you trick your brain into retaining all the information that comes your way. 
So observations cannot be confused with perceptions. So these are two words that we need to make sure that we're clear on the differences between. So observations and perceptions are different. Perceptions are made after the observation is made. Okay, so first you must observe, then you can perceive. So perceptions are made as a result of the observation. So for example, if you go to the bank and every time you go in the bank, it is cold, then you may believe that all banks are cold. Okay, so what you have done is you've made an observation. Every time I go in the bank, it's cold. Uh, and then based on that observation, you have made a perception. You believe that all banks are cold because of your one experience or one observation or many experiences or many observations. So the observation comes first. The perception is what results. All right, so what flavor is this ice cream? If you said strawberry or bubblegum or cherry, you were wrong. This is vanilla ice cream. So you might be a little confused. Why would you show us a picture of pink ice cream and then tell us it's vanilla? Uh, the reason why is because our brains are designed to remember things. And we sometimes make perceptions based on observations. If you thought this ice cream was cherry, bubblegum, strawberry, if that was your first thought, then what you did is you took an observation from the past and formed a perception around that. Now, while that's not dangerous in this case, it can be dangerous to crime scene investigation. So if I'm a forensic investigator, I cannot, I'm not supposed to anyway, make perceptions based on prior crime scenes. Sometimes that could be helpful, but that could also be detrimental to a case. Um, so I did want to just point that out. You have to be really careful about the perceptions you make. Perceptions can be faulty. Um, while we're here, I'll just, just chase a rabbit just a second. I don't know if you're familiar with the Superman ice cream. It's like a bright blue and yellow and red ice cream. Um, I remember when I was a kid going to the ice cream store and seeing it, and it caught my attention because it's bright, vibrant colors. And I remember tasting it for the first time, thinking that it was going to be made up of like a, a strawberry or a cherry and a um, like a banana flavor mix. And then when you lick it, it's just plain vanilla. I remember as a kid being so disappointed because my perception was these bright, fun colors are going to have bright, fun flavors. Um, and then when I tasted it, I realized that was not the case. All right, so how do our brains work? Now, a psychology professor would crawl under a chair at this because it is so much more complicated. But for time's sake, you just need to know for forensic science, you just need to know the basics of how the brain works. Basically, you need to understand that lots of information comes our way every day and our brains are not processed to keep all that information. So it filters it. So you can see in this image or picture, you can see all those arrows represent information. So these are things that are coming at us we pick these up via our five senses, and we only keep what we pay attention to, okay? Because if we don't pay attention, our brain does not deem it as important. So the first step is paying attention. So our brain moves it into a different lobe or different area. Then we make a perception. So if we think about it or if we tie it to a prior experience or we take the time to make mental note of it, then it gets processed in our short-term memory. Notice the arrows decrease as we move through the brain or the different processes of memory. Um, and then you have long-term memory. Um, long-term memory, there's not a lot stored there because um, your brain is not designed to keep everything in long-term memory. So things that really evoke a response or an emotion um, or that are really sentimental or are really profound life events are going to be things that are stored in long-term memory. Memory does fade with time. Um, and it is true. If you've heard the saying, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. That is true. 
Now we're going to go through some different parts of the brain um, and I'm not going to expand on this very much. Again, a psychology professor would cringe at, the, at this lesson because it's so to the point watered down. Um, but I think it's important for you to understand the four lobes of the brain and how they work because it does have an impact on forensics. So we're going to start with the frontal lobe. You can see in the image where that is on, in um, regards to the brain. And it's associated with reasoning and planning and parts of speech, emotions, problem solving. Then we have the parietal lobe, which tends to be associated with movement, orientation, recognition, and then how we perceive certain stimuli. The occipital lobe is associated with visual processing. And then we have the temporal lobe, which is where our auditory section is. It's associated with perception as well um, and memory, but also speech. Now, if you are part of my forensics class, we are going to watch an episode of Brain Games where it goes further into detail about eyewitness testimony and how that can be faulty based on how the brain works, which is really, really interesting. Um, and then we're going to come back into a future lesson where we talk more specifically about eyewitness testimony. So I'm going to save that information for the next lesson.